Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about a few different types of conflict and post-conflict trauma um, relating to political activism. So less kind of one event and more a continuum on, of conflict. So people who engage in social movements and direct action protests frequently experience state violence, which take the form of arrests, um, raids, imprisonment, and sometimes leads to death. Um, and then you also have a situation in which political activists on the left often, because I'm talking specifically about left-wing political activism, position themselves um, in relation to a more generalized violence inflicted by the state and by capitalism. So people will talk about alienation, austerity, and the loss of certain forms of, for example, public provision or working class culture in terms of like a rhetoric of conflict. So I'm going to be hopefully cramming in three different case studies. The first two relate to um, a project that I did examining the domestic material culture of political activism in London. Um, I carried out the field work for that in 2018. And after that, I hopefully will have time to talk a little bit about my ongoing research with the Kurdish community <coughs> in London as well. And both of these involve kind of varied forms of engagement um, with political materialities through home visits and interviews. I'm really focused on kind of interactive forms of, of coming up with this knowledge. Um, and just in terms of a definition, when I'm talking about political activists here, I'm talking specifically about left-wing political activists um, as people who engage in what political scientists call contentious action, because obviously protest would be too straightforward. Um, so what is generally included in this um, is actions like strikes, um, various forms of campaigning, demonstrations, occupations, but also other civil disobedience, including graffiti, riots, other protesty things. Um, I'm going to start. No, I'm not going to. Oh, there we go. So I just wanted to put in Phil Cohen's book cover because I find it hilarious. Um, and I, n I don't really like the long blocky quotes, but this one actually captures a lot of in interesting things. So Phil Cohen writes, <coughs> the funerals of fallen comrades create real as well as imagined communities of mourners around them. And sometimes, of course, they turn into mass demonstrations in which a sense of outrage is tempered by feelings of loss. At other times, the slogan, don't mourn, organize, forecloses the experience of grief or transforms it into grievance. Recently, the concept of active mourning has emerged in an attempt to find some kind of emotional balance between grief and anger. So Phil Cohen is specifically talking about um, the deaths of political activists or people involved in social movements. But this extract also sums up some general and central strands to political rem remembrance beyond just kind of ideas of martyrdom. So first is the management of grief and trauma. So the coming up of different coping mechanisms by which you can kind of try and move on from these traumatic events. And then there's also the element that that this kind of management of trauma takes in terms of movement building. So it becomes integral to the construction of individual and collective identity within political movements. So part of that is also kind of creating these communities that might be spatially or temporally distant and trying to bring them together. So I'm going to start with this object case study of a, um, a fragment of a tear gas canister. Um, which is on the left hand side, which if I were a serious archaeologist, I would have put in a scale in that photo, <laughs> but it is about five centimetres across, so it would fit into the palm, palm of your hand. And in depth, it's about one centimetre, so a kind of flat metal object. And on the right hand side, this is a photo from Gideon Mendel's um, series of photos of objects collected in the Calais jungle, where obviously tear gas has been used in quite an astounding quantity. Um, so these are the bottom halves of tear gas canisters. That plastic bit contains the, the chemicals themselves. Then you have this kind of flat metal disc that sits on top of that and connects to the nozzle, which releases the gas. 
Um, and this specific um, fragment of a canister came from tear gas that was fired in the early summer of 2016 during the Nuit Debout protests in Paris against proposed labour reforms. And it was collected by a young political activist from London who had been engaged in various kind of housing and land rights struggles and frequently gone to demonstrations and squats in, in France. Um, and I'm going to quote from her because she described her encounter with tear gas. We were approaching the river and we saw what looked like a cloud on the street. It was all tear gas. I've been to Paris a few times for protests. Sometimes you see police firing tear gas into a crowd and the crowd kicking the canisters back at the police while they're still releasing gas. We were picking up bits of empty tear gas canisters and putting them in our, in our pockets. It's a bit of a cliche to go to Paris for a demonstration and to come back with gas canisters. The canisters were still covered in residue and my hands started stinging from touching them. My pockets would sting my hands for weeks afterwards. I thought about using it as a paperweight, but it's too light for that. I keep it on the shelf now because I think it's a cool thing to have and it reminds me of that week in Paris. It was a good week. So this fragment of a tear gas canister has been brought back to London, put on a shelf, and now it kind of sits there alongside jewellery, sewing equipment, kind of various things that you might have in your room if you're a young woman. Um, and in its new environment, it's become a memento of this week spent in Paris. And it's also quite an appropriate souvenir because tear gas is very rarely used in the UK. So it is, in essence, a foreign object. Um, so the specific kind of trauma that we're talking about with tear gas um, is the kind of general trauma of being in a situation of conflict in, in which there's immediate physical danger. And tear gas itself um, causes choking, vomiting, eye burning and eye watering and a burning sensation in the respiratory system. And usually in the quantities that are deployed against the street protest, it can cause quite significant psychological trauma. And Anna Feigenbaum's research um, on kind of deaths and serious injuries from being struck by tear gas canisters shows that this is a very common occurrence across the globe. Um, so tear gas is a traumatic experience to be survived and a, re a memory that you have to control in some way afterwards. And this is frequently done through the act of collecting, obviously. This is something that Gabe Mashenska, for example, talks about in terms of kids collecting pieces of shrapnel during World War II. So this kind of transformation of, of dangerous objects into, into collectibles that you can take into the home and integrate into your social relations is something that also plays out here. And I've got, ooh, I've got this extract from um, Hunter Walker, who's an American journalist, who describes predators collecting tear gas canisters during the Occupy protests in Oakland, California. So here you have a tear gas canister and actually a grenade, which is like a whole new level of, of protest materiality. We don't really have those in Europe. Um, laying in the curb, a man standing nearby and he's kind of reserving them for himself. So he's letting them cool off. Um, and he says, everybody's taking them. You've got to act fast. Um, so here the collector can survive the dangerous event and come out with a conquest or trophy. And Anna Feigenbaum writes that people reorient their relationship to these objects. They become a miniature archive of trauma, of survival or perseverance and a personal treasure. So the canister aligns the collector with other people targeted by tear gas and it creates a collective identity. And in the same account from Hunter Walker about Occupy Oakland, um, one protester describes his two experiences of being tear gassed as terrible, but then he adds, it does feel good to know that I've been gassed and to know that I've been a part of this. So I'm going to move on to my second case study now. So from this transformation of personal trauma into a memento, um, I'm going to turn to like the sense of collective loss um, and trauma in a shared political consciousness. Oh, this one. So this is a banner um, which was a dominant feature in a living room in an East London flat that I visited as part of my field work. Um, it has applique lettering on it um, and the 
person who made it, whose living room this was in, had made it by hand out of various scrap fabrics. And I'm just going to read it out because I'm not sure you can see. Um, these are lyrics from the song Bread and Roses. It reads, no more the drudge and idler, tend that toil while one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. So this is a song which is particularly associated with um, trade union movements and other left-wing movements in the Anglo-American left. Um, and the maker of this banner described the song as a touchstone for feeling hopeful about politics. And about this banner, they said that craft skills are often gendered and not valued, but there's a long tradition on the left of producing things like this. Trade union banners are important to me. They're like tangible displays of solidarity and community and how these ideals are central to working class movements. So in my fieldwork, I wasn't really planning on looking at people's engagement with radical heritage, but this is an example of how it actually kept coming up. Um, <coughs> so it became clear to me that if we're looking at activists in conflict with capitalism and the state, as people on the left often perceive themselves, these understandings of conflict have to be broadened out from just direct confrontation on the streets and, for example, experiences being tear gas. Um, and for many of the activists that I interviewed, crafting was not only about the creation of new material culture, but a reflexive engagement with technologies of protest and various kind of previous forms of aesthetic and craft traditions of political movements. Um, and here, for example, the form of the banner, so it has a broom handle running along the top, which you then attach to a kind of other stick and you carry it as a kind of very upright banner um, that borrows quite directly from the classic shape of a trade union banner. And these other two are just little examples. They, these have been on display at the People's History Museum in Manchester, and I just wanted to include them because I love them. Um, so David Ray describes, who, who's done work on trade union banners, he describes trade union banners as really integral to working class community building um, and argues that the lodge banner is at the centre of all trade union activity and that it has become perhaps even more important now that a lot of those industrial jobs have been lost. Um, and to an extent, <laughs> David Ray says that these banners have become um, like personified um, representations of, of working class movements and they, uh, that they possess the collective memory of the community that they were created to represent. So obviously this ties into this kind of broader narrative of, of loss and conflict um, on, the, on the left in the UK. Um, if we look at these banners as stand-ins for collective memory, we have to ask, what is that collective memory? And what it seems to be is that it's linking to these ideas of brass bands, miners' galas, working men's clubs, and industrial jobs, which have obviously been lost to globalisation, um, changes in trade union legislation, and the onward march of capitalism. Um, and in this narrative of conflict and defeat, some moments are of heightened importance. So you can look at, for example, how people talk about the minor strikes and these kind of heightened moments of battle and conflict within this broader um, ongoing crisis of neoliberalism and austerity. So this banner, um, which has been only crafted a few years ago, is embedded in this living tradition, as well as lamenting and fighting its loss. And it demonstrates the need many political activists feel to reclaim the shared heritage of past protest movements. Now, re to return to Phil Cohen, he points out that the left has developed a very bizarre and specific melancholic engagement with this imagined shared past and has created a view of close-knit homogenous working class communities, which doesn't necessarily correspond to kind of real historical um, lives. Um, and obviously has also been very effectively weaponized by the far right in attempts to justify nationalism and certain forms of racism. <laughs> so if we think about the imagined communities that this creates, obviously you can link these ideas of working class communities to a certain form of nationalism. And I find it very interesting that a lot of the people that I interviewed spoke about this balancing act that is involved in, in engaging with this heritage. So the need to kind of create these 
these visual links to it and these material links to it without fetishizing it, without buying into, into kind of reductive and reactionary ideas of, of a left-wing past. And obviously this is also in the context of London, where actually the London left is hu hugely um, diverse in, in just pure demographic terms, and many of the people that I spoke to are not English or British. So that also kind of complicates the engagement that people have with this kind of material culture. And again, this is obviously um, a kind of reworked and reimagined form of a trade union banner. It's not a direct copy. So that I think speaks, speaks to that as well. And I think particularly it's interesting that this is something that often comes up in, in feminist, feminist ideas about community building and movement building is the need to connect these ide ideas of a shared past. So Bell Hooks talks about this a little bit in thinking about a home space, um, which she argues is a site that is integral to building community and fighting alienation. And they, the um, shared heritage that people engage with and ideas of solidarity play a really key role in creating these spaces for marginalized people. And similarly, um, Silvia Federici argues for the need to engage with collective history and for social memory to be made into a tool of activism and for specifically for dismantling individualism. Again, I apologize for the enormous quote. You would almost think that I enjoy this. Um, so I won't read it out to you because I have three minutes. Um, but basically she sees this, um, this reclaiming of heritage, again, on a continuum of conflict where you're essentially trying to wrest control over left-wing heritage um, from this kind of compromised and and like compromised and and erasing form of engagement that is you're more likely to find um, in in wider society. So to create um, kind of grassroots bottom up engagements with with left wing heritage. And I'm going to really really briefly talk about my ongoing research which I'm doing in Kurdish community centres in North London. Um, so a slightly different, different thing from domestic material cultures. These are photos from a community centre in Harringay Green Lanes, so not very far from here. Um, and these community centres for the Kurdish community are not only a radical space in themselves, in that the act of calling a space a Kurdish space immediately makes people um, and these spaces a target of criminalization and state attention, even in the UK, um, or maybe especially in the UK. Um, and they are also spaces of mourning, especially considering that a lot of the people who are very involved in the Kurdish community have come to this country as refugees and many have faced imprisonment and torture um, in, in Turkey specifically, in the case of the UK Kurdish community. So in these community centres, pretty much every wall surface features these portraits of martyrs to the movement. Um, so you have kind of flags, frescoes, banners, photographs, um, which are often accompanied by the slogan, Shayad Namarin, um, which can be translated to English as the martyrs are immortal. So this evokes um, a continuity of struggle and it also seems to pass on a responsibility for carrying on this political fight to people who enter this space. Um, and I'm wrapping up now. So to return to the Phil Cohen quote at the start, he described the transformation of grief to grievance. And what you see in these different case studies um, of kind of transformations of, of trauma into individual and collective political identity you arrive at the question of how left-wing, marginalised and working-class communities cope with the brutality you encounter through engaging in political organising. So on the surface, there's the trauma that has to be dealt with and fallen comrades whose lives must be remembered. But beyond that psychological need and that moral duty of remembrance, there's a wider left-wing culture of remembrance that these also slot into. So the act of remembrance itself becomes a part of that continuum of resistance. Um, and maybe 
more accurately, the slogan don't mourn, organize can be um, made into a less severe instruction, mourn and organize. And as a very final note, I want to return to this photo that I had on my title slide, which is from a demonstration in, in 2018 in London. You might recognize this as just outside of Downing Street. Um, Anna Campbell, whose photo was also featured on one of the um, <coughs> banners in the Kurdish Community Centre, was a young British woman who travelled <coughs> to northern Syria to join the YPJ, which is part of the women's, um, women's battalion of the Syrian Defence Forces, and she was killed in airstrikes by the Turkish state in the northern Syrian city of Afrin in 2018. And this um, banner I find really interesting. It's made and carried by friends of Anna Campbell. Um, and <coughs> this banner, which kind of borrows the phrasing of the Kurdish movement, is actually visually linked to the British feminist movement and these specific traditions of crafting banners out of scrap materials. So I just want to finish with this um, because I think it really encapsulates these connections and these different kind of comings together that people engage with in the act of mourning and also in continuing with the duty of resistance. Thank you.